your work in Americana, you've described it as a grassroots movement. You've worked really hard petitioning things like the Grammys to get Americana more of its own lane. Um, can you kind of you know, talk a little bit about your own history with the genre and also just touch on your work as more of a grassroots feel? The Americana Music Association started as a reaction uh, to commercial country music deciding to, uh, it was a combination. They decided, they were infatuated uh, with Garth Brooks and Shania Twain. And at, at somewhere in the mid-90s there, they decided artists like Roseanne Cash, Rodney Crowell, Dwight Yoakam, Katie Lang, Emmy Lou Harris, Joe Ely, they just, they weren't interested in them. They were going for the money. Concurrently, in the mid-90s, you had an FCC ruling uh, which consol effectively consolidated radio stations around the country. Um, that was a big problem for all genres of music, for the music industry in general, because you went from 10,000 radio stations to 10 radio companies owning 10,000 radio stations. So the opportunities for those artists of integrity were gone um, as the country, commercial country music officially declared themselves the commercial country music, whether spoken or unspoken. So this organization came out uh, due to some people who wanted to sh shine a light on those artists who otherwise would not be heard. Started in 1999, about 33 people got together, 30-something people got together in, in, at South By, South By Southwest in Austin in the spring of 99. They agreed to get together again in Nashville that, later that fall where they fought about what is this going to be called? Is it the, I, I think the first agenda was the Roots Music Summit. And they spent two days together and they had a corporate facilitator, which is kind of funny, um, basically go in to try to help them to refine what their mission was and what they were aspiring to do. So the original mission was, you know, uh, to foster growth for those people in the business they were calling Americana, which is funny because they were, they defined a mission statement to foster growth for something nobody knew existed in terms of a word, wasn't in the dictionary, wasn't really a term the average person used. So it was very, very grassroots, starting with, with 33 people. Um, and, you know, by then, you, you know, artists were being peeled off of the major labels. You know, Roseanne Cash was, you know, on a major label. Emmy was on major labels. Mary Chapin Carpenter was on Columbia Records. And, and they were having to find new ways to get their music out and to dis distribute their music. Um, the community, the membership community, um, when I started in 2007, there were 790 something members. Um, I don't think we had one major label representative. I don't think uh, we had very few wonderful people like Jay Williams, who was sitting here, uh, was on uh, our board of directors very early on. There was a handful of people who got it, um, but by and large, we've been forced into, uh, in some ways, you know, we started as a grassroots movement, and uh, because of the beliefs and ideals of the artists we represent, we, we're sort of stuck, <laughs> uh, stuck with the beautiful thing that is a grassroots movement. Um, Absolutely. Um, I know when Brandi Carlisle won her Grammy for, by the way, I forgive you. Yes, Brandi. Um, she won it for Best Americana Record and described the Americana scene as the island of misfit toys. Um, for, I mean, if you want to explore a little bit on kind of that idea of Americana being a little more open to more women, uh, things like, you know, more diversity in sound. Uh, I know even yesterday, the Americana uh, Awards, which Jed oversees, uh, announced their Artist of the Year, and all of them are women for the first time ever, which is an incredible thing. Um, Brandi Carlisle, Rhiannon Giddens, Casey Musgraves, Mavis Staples, all phenomenal, phenomenal artists who happen to be women, because people like Brandi, and Casey are dominating the airwaves, not to mention Mavis Staples is just a titan on the touring scene. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if they're dominating the airwaves. The, the, the airwaves, radio has... Well, is, critically. Is, yes. Um, I think that, well, first, um, I thought the previous panel was fantastic, but I think there's a really important distinction that needs to be made here. 
um, and it also references our title. Um, in 2008, uh, after convincing the Recording Academy to create the Best Americana album category, Grammy category, um, they had, you know, there's only so much you can do. Like, you know, I wrote, I, I drafted letters, I petitioned the trustees. It was a battle to get them to put, to create a new category called Best Americana Album. So they did that, and I was very happy, but I couldn't then tell them what that meant. I mean, it's their award. So later th that year, we were very happy that they did that, but then they presented uh, the criteria, like what is the definition for a record that qualifies for Americana Album of the Year, and they used that word twang. Um, my first approach to the Grammys was to uh, draft the letter um, and engage artists like Bonnie Raitt and and Joan Baez and Roseanne and Dwight and Rodney and a host of others um, to create the category. My second action was to say, please take the word twang out of it, um, which they did by 2010. Um, the reason being is that, first of all, Americana is not country. So I, I wasn't following the whole conversation here, but I think that panel would agree Americana is not country too. Um, Country, as we know it today, is a commercial format. And it, 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 there, should be no, there should be no animosity from one towards the other. There should be no disagreement. One is a commercial art form, the other is a fine art form. Um, you know, uh, Ansel Adams wasn't engaged to take photographs for real estate brochures. Um, Pablo Picasso, was not engaged to create murals for Best Buy. Um, there's a difference, and people are successful in both ways. Um, I think somebody on this panel commented, you know, country today is, is, is by and large the songwriter community dominant. They're writing hits. They're directed by labels to write hits. An Americana artist is writing a song to tell a story through music in the best way they can. So that's the first distinction that needs to be made. In terms of the transitions, in 2010, we invited Candy Staten, who by all accounts from Muscle Shoals would be defined as a soul artist, um, to our uh, award show. In subsequent years, we've invited Dr. John, we've invited Booker T, Last year we had Buddy Guy. Um, to me, Americana is a, is a horizontal genre. It's not a vertical genre. I think that the vertical genre, the nature of vertical genres in the music business is, has killed the music business in terms of the artistic expression um, that we face today, which goes back to that panel about Facebook and social media and all that stuff we talked about yesterday and, and earlier this morning. Um, Americana is a horizontal genre. So it, it incorporates American roots music traditions from gospel to traditional country to, uh, to the blues to rock and roll. And so it goes across this way. It's not cut this way. Um, that's a really important um, distinction. I think the folk community, the bluegrass community, the gospel community, um, the traditional country community, I mean, some of the biggest fights you'll see on, on the web, you know, if you follow Saving Country Music uh, blog at all, I mean, you know, they're going crazy on each other, complaining about what is country music and what isn't country music, what is Americana. I don't care what any of those things are. If Emmy Lou Harris next week makes a record with Skrillex, it wouldn't surprise me. I wouldn't call her an Americana artist, even though the great body of her work is Americana music by my definition, but I would call Emmylou Harris an artist. Mm -hmm. I would call Sturgill Simpson an artist. Um, oh, and by the way, I, whoever said it, and I love you dearly, that last record of Sturgill Simpson's was not country. I mean, that was a psychedelic rock record. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the beauty and the strength of Americana um, is in its diversity. Um, 
seeing, you know, we've honored Mavis. Mavis will be coming this year. I mean, our nominees for Artist of the Year, you know, Casey, um, the iconoclastic country music artist, as she has been called. Why is she called that? Because she's not a country music artist. Mm -hmm. The record wasn't a country music album. She's awesome, and is she inspired by country music? Yes. It's all about inspiration. Um, Brandy is a fucking rock star. Hell yes. She's inspired by folk music. She's inspired by great songwriting. Uh, Mavis, I mean, my God, she like, you know, you know, she and her dad walked the streets of Washington, D.C. and sang for freedom. Um, and Rhiannon is like the most brilliant artist on the planet. Recently won a MacArthur Genius Award two years ago. Um, she's the most articulate. She, hearing her talk is as inspiring as hearing her sing. Um, but these are four unique artists. And the fact that they're women is cool and is awesome. And I'm proud that, I mean, I don't know how many other major awards, and I don't even mean to presume that the Americana Awards are major at all. I have no idea. But I don't know how many other award shows have nominated only women in their most important or prestigious category. And f for that, I'm proud of. Um, but it's, you know, we've honored, the American Music Association has honored more women in the last 50 years than the Country Music Hall of Fame. The American Music Association has honored more people of color in the last five years than uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's easy. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> well, but, I, but my point is, is not to ask for praise for that. It's to understand this is how, this is the community we live in. And I think this is the Relics community and it's the Brooklyn Bowl community. And, you know, I mean, it needs to be talked about and it needs to be mentioned. But um, to me, the four names that appeared on the Artist of the Year category are four incredible human beings and artists, and we shouldn't even have to have that conversation about what gender or race they live in. And that's the sad thing. Absolutely. Um, okay, I pontificated then, enough. <laughs> and then this being, um, this actually leads perfectly to my next question. Um, obviously, you know, the Americana Music Associate, Association has a clear ethos, but this being a business and live music conference, how do you apply that to your six-day conference and award show when it comes to six days, 500 performances, 60 venues? I know the relics people here cannot imagine a six-day conference. A two-day, you know, runs us ragged enough. It's it's become nuts, and and we had a turning point uh, five or six years ago. And I went to our board, and I said that five-paragraph mission statement about fostering growth for those in the business of Americana is ridiculous. Um, in about eight or nine years ago, I got a phone call from Roseanne Cash's manager. And I didn't know Rose. I had met her like once. And Danny Kahn called me and he said, hey, Rose, wants you to go to this benefit concert in bumfuck Arkansas and to uh, and and then to go visit her dad's childhood home and I said I'm a single dad with three kids it's fall break that ain't happening and about an hour later Roseanne Cash called me and in and said please come um, it, it's important so I convinced the kids that uh, the Civil Wars were popping. They, like, I don't know that they were famous. They were opening the show. It was, it was Rose, Willie, and the Civil Wars. So, I, so my, my kids knew the Civil Wars because I knew uh, JP and, and um, John Paul White and, and Joy Williams because that's my job. And, um, and so I took my kids, and, and I did take their earbuds out so that they could listen to at least one Willie song, and I'm proud to say it was Roll Me Up and Smoke Me When I Die. <laughs> <sighs> yes, they are older teenagers now, and they appreciate that song. <laughs> um, 
But the following day, we, we, we went out to, to Johnny Cash's childhood home, which his parents were given by the government. It was part of the New Deal. It was literally 40 acres and a mule. It was literally closer to the moon than it was to civilization. <laughs> it was a shack about the size of this stage with four rooms and a fireplace in the middle, so it was like a donut. And we get there, and first there were two government officials who were saying, go away, go away, this is private, and then Rose from the front porch says, no, no, he's with me. I don't even know this woman. So we get out of the car, I bring my three ducklings, we walk in, and it's Rose, her husband John, and her son Jake. That's it. And I'm looking around going, where is it? What, what's what's kind of going on here? And we walk through the room, and she started telling stories about this is where dad slept. You know, this is where, you know, she talked about her brother, Johnny's brother, who, who passed away in the war, and the two other siblings. Um, we didn't make it into room two of the four in a room this big without just all of us in tears. And I realized that Roseanne Cash had invited the executive director of the Americana Music Association to come and visit her dad's childhood home on the occasion of her first visit to her dad's childhood home. And it was mind blowing and I spent a lot of time like, what is my job? Is my job to help Rose sell records? My job is to help Rose protect her inspiration. My job is to help Ry Cooter protect his inspiration. My job is to protect Bob Weir to protect his inspiration and to trans help to translate that for the next generation, for the preservation of this great American art form. So, um, thank you. It's kind of like, um, you know, to illustrate the beauty of these artists, uh, two years ago we had Bonnie Raitt, I don't know if you know, we do Americana Fest at NYC at Lincoln Center, which is crazy, because I was born in Bronxville. And um, so I kind of, and, and Lincoln Center approached me many years ago and said, hey, would you consider curating an event at Lincoln Center? <laughs> and they didn't know my history. And I, you know, I was like, I lived in New York for 18 years before I moved to Nashville. And I was like, you don't have to pitch me. <laughs> like, I get it, yes. Um, and we had Bonnie rate a couple years ago and, and it was a particular, thrill and I said, you know, if somebody had told me at, when I was 17 years old that however many years later, um, I would be introducing Bonnie Raitt at Damrush Park in Lincoln Center, um, you know, I would have said from your lips to God's ears. And Bonnie's response was, if somebody had told me in 1976, which was the occasion I first saw Bonnie as a young teenager, um, uh, and that I would be playing in front of thousands of people at Domrush Park and Lincoln Center, and you'd be introducing me, I would have said from God's lips, God's lips to your, to, God's lips to your ears. The, the, the point being is, is that the, the essence of what we try to do at the American Music Association is honor that inspiration. And it's not about, um, you know, T-Bone Burnett talks about if you make a great song, um, it, it, it's the, the measure of success um, is, is inconsequential to everyone else. And it's, it's about what the artist wants to do, what the artist has the latitude to do, and it's our job to support the artists and their vision and dreams of how they want to do that. Five years ago, we changed our mission statement from that five paragraph thing to something really simple that I can recite to you, which is to advocate for the authentic voice of American roots music around the world. That's it, you can check it. I think I'm spot on. I might've missed a letter or a word or a pronoun. Um, that changed everything. Since then, We've gone from having 5,000 people attend our event and 14 venues and uh, um, 
well, we, we've, you know, we're now at 65 to 70 venues in the city of Nashville. We have 29,000 people attending, uh, more than 50,000 over the six-day conference. Um, we have 300 bands that are selected who come and perform for a $150 honorarium, which is crazy. Um, but they, we're not making money. Um, we're, we're, we're breaking even, we're definitely growing, we're making more money and we're spending more money. Um, and I think it's definitely working to raise the bar. Um, I mean, one thing I totally agree with what, the, what this panel was talking about, it was like most of the industry executives in the country music business and most of the, and many of the premier acts in the country music business uh, they all want to write songs like John Prine. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't? You know? So I think we're very respected um, uh, as, as uh, the, the artists in the community are very respected. Um, they're, they're very uh, welcoming. Um, but it's, all, you know, my definition is almost like um, whether or not it's fucking great. And I think the, the kind of takeaway for you know everybody here in their own ventures, I think, is what you were saying kind of about your mission statement. It's about intent and it's about cl uh, clarity, yeah. kind of knowing what you want to accomplish and you know being strong in your resolve. I mean, would you agree with that? No, without a doubt. I mean, you know, I realized early on that, that we, and I will address the country music issue because without the country music, commercial country music community, this organization, and this community wouldn't exist. It was a reaction, you know, from the alt country community, if, if, if you will, that created the community. Um, I believe the community is broader. I believe Jane Doe in Portland, Maine, listens to Patty Griffin and the Preservation Hall. Um, um, I think that uh, we've definitely gotten to a point in where we need to understand we need to just appreciate mu music in a broader, uh, in, in, in a broader way, and what warms our heart. And um, you know, I, I would agree that um, I don't know. I'm sort of going off on a uh, going off on a, on a tangent, but um, I think the commercial realities of Americana music are becoming more and more prevalent, and it's just. It's, it's based on that passion of the artists and the community that's supporting them. Absolutely. Um, I think we have time. Th Jed, thank you so much for your time. I think we have time for one or two questions, if anybody wants to pick Jed's mind. They want the Got bar to the open. There. Five hundred or how many? Fifty shows, five hundred shows, six days. I know it's a lot. I went down to Nashville a couple years ago. You know, you got your main event, which is one thing, and then there's just so much going on. I'm curious how that's coordinated, how that's organized, what's central just through you, that you book, how much do you work with the local venues, how much are the venues allowed to book themselves, or is it all just, um, what's the format of the festival, how it works? <laughs> it's gotten out of control. Um, I mean, we, you know, we literally had you know, fewer than 20 venues five, five years ago. And, and now we have 23 official nighttime showcases. Um, we make a, we are sticklers. We, we, we're not like South By. We don't have the Columbia label showcase or, you know, that kind of a thing. I mean, we produce all the showcases. Um, like South By, we are seeing more and more renegade events pop up. So the direct answer to the question is we do everything. Um, there was two people on staff 10, 12 years ago when I started. We now have seven. Um, I am playing whack-a-mole every year when I find out somebody's doing an off-the-grid renegade event, and I'm like, hey, we're a nonprofit. Don't do this. If you do this and everybody else does, th does this, we're going away. We can't afford to compete on that level. So a lot of whack-a-mole going, going on. All of the venues, with exception to the Ryman, with exception to the Ryman, donate their rooms to us for free. We are a very strong beer drinking community. <laughs> so the, 
they will tell you, I think the great majority of the venues that we are in, they will say it's their number one week in alcohol sales. <laughs> um, and I'm dead serious. I mean, that's how this, this works. It started from the appreciation for what we do, for recognizing we're not making money off of this. Um, and, and that our you know, mission is to advocate for these great artists. We curate everything. We decide who goes in every venue. Uh, we consult with the venues because, you know, Todd Olhauser owns the Cannery Ballroom. There's 1,100 people there. Well, I better make sure that, you know, you know, last year or whatever, the year before, I think maybe you were there, Peter, uh, it was like, awesome. The Lumineers want to do an underplay. We, we can't announce them until two days before because they just sold out Bridgestone Arena with 18,000 people six months earlier. How are we going to do this? We were nervous because we were afraid we'd get killed. But, you know, we figured it out. We announced it two days before the Lumineers got, you know, they went in because we, they, we knew they would fill an 1,100 capacity room. But then conversely, you know, we love doing the ultimate underplay, the Station Inn was a club the other folks mentioned. If you don't know, it's, it's a legendary bluegrass venue. It's, um, uh, it's a 135-seat it's a room, and, and every year we try to do something really special. Um, and it's hit or miss, and of all the people who are attending the event, most of them aren't getting in, but the opportunity to see a Guy Clark or a Richard Thompson or a John Prine or a Marty Stewart doing a solo acoustic thing um, it, it, in the station in, you know, there's, you know, we have to do like this RSVP first come first serve thing and we only hold back 10 seats out of that. We give them all away, first come first serve. Um, we try to be as fair as possible. Um, you know, the owner of that club, you know, JP loves that we do those types of things because you know, they're extraordinary events. 90% of the people who are tender are pissed off at us, but they know that we do it every year. And I'll tell you, the 135 people that get into those shows will never forget it. So once in a lifetime experiences. Is that helping this sort of answer? Yeah. yeah. We're given the venues. I mean, it's, it's a, this whole thing is a community effort and it wouldn't, you know, to, to another theme from the earlier panel. I mean, there is a community um, uh, in, in Nashville um, that is quite remarkable, um, but it, it, it is a, another community, um, a separate community. I mean, Jay and, and, and Emily and, and Michael are, in particular, are uh, extraordinary human beings because they're able to go from one world to, to the other. Um, I get in trouble because I have a hard time doing that, if that makes sense. Um, I think one, one quick one, one more quick one. Yeah, would you say that part <laughs> of the greatness of the format is the discovery of new artists for, for people who maybe never heard of half these artists, but can yeah, discover I, them? Yeah, I would encourage, um, I think the greatest experience we all have as music fans um, I will say that that was my girlfriend who asked that question, so she's clearly a shill. Um, but the greatest, uh, the greatest thing we all experience as, as music lovers is that you know, point of discovery. And, and we all will remember the first time we heard those songs that changed our lives and rocked our worlds. Um, I will, to me, to me that's, why I do what I do. I have a, uh, to me, the most exciting thing in, in music um, is not going to see a, a band that I love and I grew up with and to hear them play their, the songs that, to me, the most exciting thing in music is to go into a room and see somebody that maybe I had heard of, maybe I hadn't, but I hadn't seen before and to have my socks get blown off. Um, and I will it. tell you, if you, uh, Americana Fest takes place September 10th through, I'm going to give my plug now, Do September it. 10th through the 15th, um, it is the stupidest uh, uh, event in the country. Our, our 
six-day festival pass is $90. So that's stupid. Uh, I just raised the price this year from $75 to $90. Um, there's a fancier pass that costs like $350 that gets you priority admission, but we've kept that general price down. And I will tell you, in, in the, if you go to any of those venues, the 23 different venues that we're using for the nighttime shows, or, or even the other 40 venues for the secondary shows and the parties in the backyards and all that kind of stuff, um, you will see something you never heard of before, and you will follow that artist for the rest of your life. I can give you that. Awesome. Jed Haley, everybody. Thank you so much.